Well, I just can't thank you enough for allowing us the opportunity to come tonight and worship with you, yep. and worship our Lord. Um, it's been an awesome time to come home and just get refreshed before we go back in the field. And I have to tell you, I was doing so well with weight loss. I tried for the first, the last month we were there in Honduras, I dropped 20 pounds, no joke. And I was doing so well. And my grandmother passed, and so I had to come home early this time. I had to come home in September. But you know, if you have a death in the family, people bring just ungodly amounts of food to your house, right? And the most amazing desserts. So I got there and I was looking at it. I was like, oh, that's, that looks good. I'll just have one little bite, you know. And then, oh, look at that. I'll have another little bite. And then by like the third or fourth bite, I stuck my face in like the plate of it. So I fell off the wagon and I told my wife, well, when I fell off that wagon, I pushed that puppy down the hill and burned it. But um, <laughs> I gained every bit of that 20 pounds back. But I have to tell you this quick story too. We went to our home church that Lindsay and I grew up in. We, we met when Lindsay was five and I was seven in church and we grew up together in that church. Of course, she was a mean little girl and hated me. I don't know why. Wouldn't date me until her senior year of high school. But uh, anyway, we went to our home church and you know, in your home church, you have people that have been in your life and they, they will keep you accountable, whether you want them to or not. They'll keep you accountable. So a lady came up to me and she's an older lady and she came up and she said, Wesley, you are fat. <laughs> Dead in the eye, you are fat. And I said, oh, uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I've put on quite a bit of weight. <laughs> and she said, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Lord? And I said, I didn't know what to do, y'all. I looked at her, and I guess it kind of West rose up instead of Jesus. And I said, yes, ma'am. Uh, and at this location, God is building a mega church. <laughs> but anyway, so it is good to be back, though, and back with good friends and family and food. But uh, I wanted to take a minute and just introduce our family, who we are, what we're about, and how we came or went to the mission field and some of the stories that, and things that have happened while we were there. But I already mentioned we grew up together, Lindsay and I, and got married after college been married going on 13 years this year, and we have three of our own children, Bella, Nate, and Marley. Bella's 11, Nate is 8, and Marley is 7. And as we, when we were first married in 2005, um, about a year later, I had the opportunity to go on my first mission trip. Now, you have to understand that Lindsay has always felt a call to missions, but I told her, you will not get me in a foreign country. God has not called me to do that. And so I went on my first mission trip. I had the opportunity to go with our church to Honduras, and um, we went to Guatemala and Nicaragua as well on that trip. But during our time in Honduras, I met some random missionaries that were not affiliated with our trip, and I believe it was a God appointment. And we were actually on the, the road <laughs> looking for sweet tea, which is a hard thing to find in Honduras. But we were walking down the road in um, this little village and saw faces that looked familiar. They looked like our faces. And I thought, maybe they speak English. And sure enough, they did. And they came up to us wanting to speak English. And they said, oh, talk to us a minute. We haven't had anyone that speaks English in months. And I said, sure. Do you know where we can get sweet tea? And then <laughs> they said, come to our house and we'll fix you some sweet tea. So that sealed the deal. We went to their house. But there they had um, their ministry with handicapped children. And my heart broke in a way it's never been broken before. Because when I met these children and saw their stories and just the awful, awful things that they've gone through in their lives. It broke my heart in a way that's never been broken before. And so at the time, I was working at North Greenville University in the upstate of South Carolina um, as an admissions counselor or recruiter. And I came back from that trip, and my heart was forever changed. And I looked at Lindsay, and I said, Darling, I know you've always felt the call to missions. And I said, my heart right, is right there right now. But I need to, I, I told her, I don't want a better car. I don't want a bigger house. I just want to serve the Lord with all my heart. And I said, whatever way God will use us, I want God to use us. And so we began to pray for an open door for the mission field, if that's what God truly wanted for us. And during that time, we were presented an opportunity to go work in an orphanage in the upstate South Carolina. And there we served as house parents and in different roles for over six years. The, God allowed us to be there and work with children that... Um, Maybe we're not physically handicapped, but they had a lot of needs, emotional needs and emotional scars from, from hurt and pain uh, from their past. And so 
God allowed us to minister there, and then the time came, there were um, some changes at the home that kind of forced our hand. There were, our children were being put in some dangerous situations, and so we decided we had to move on. Well, you have to understand that during that time, that was the whole time of me praying, saying, God, I need you to prove that this wasn't a workup of my, of my emotions, but that you're really calling me, Lord. And so during that time, I really felt like God had proven himself. And then I got confused as to why, um, why would we leave if this is what God has called us to? Well, not two months after we left the home and we found random jobs, I found a job with a copier company. Lindsay found a job with a dentist. Um, we had a friend from college whom we'd had, we had no contact with for years. And she said, I've been praying and your name just keeps coming up. And she said, have you ever considered coming to a foreign country and, and working or, or serving in missions? Not knowing that we've been praying for 11 years for God to open a door. And so we said, absolutely. We've been praying. We don't even have to pray about this one. We've been praying for 11 years. We'll go for it. And she had some positions open for teachers in her school, and she is the administrator there. Her name's Brooke Pizzotti. She actually is from Monk's Corner. Um, got to see her this afternoon for a few minutes. But we decided we'd go down and do that. And we served there for a little, over, little less than a year as teachers. And then in April of this year, we were approached about uh, taking on the position of director of the home. And this was a huge deal because uh, you, you have to understand that lead teachers are kind of like low man on the totem pole. And that, that the director position is the, the top position at the home there on property. And so when we were approached about this, it's one of those moments where um, doubt, self-doubt started rising up. And I said, God, I need you to speak to me in this moment. It's not that I don't believe in you. It's not that I don't trust you. I just need, your, I need you to speak to me, to know that this is the next step for our family and this is what we need to do. And this is how good God is and this is why I want to testify about it. So we were praying about that <clears throat> and I needed confirmation somehow, some way. And um, I asked God for something very specific, which is probably dangerous, but I wanted to hear from God. And so I said, God, if you're telling us to do this, I need you to do this for me. It was the middle of dry season, and dry season lasts about four months in Honduras. And I said, God, could you send rain? Could you send rain just to confirm what I feel like you're telling me to do, but just for confirmation, God. And so I, as we prayed that prayer, I said, God, I, won't, I just want you to send rain with thunder and lightning for at least 20 minutes, God. Just something that I know. So two days later, we're sitting at the dinner table, having dinner, and all of a sudden we hear rain. And it's in the middle of dry season. And it got louder and heavier and louder. And then all of a sudden we heard thunder and lightning. And, I, and then it kept on for over 20 minutes. And I looked at Lindsay and I said, well, I guess we have our answer. And then it kept raining. And it kept raining. And so about 10 o'clock, we decided it was time to go to bed. And so you have to understand that also that in our little house, it was a tiny little house, Every time it would rain, we have one wall in our house that was in our bedroom, and the rain would come down the wall and would flood in our bedroom. And so I said, Lindsay, honey, let's go get some towels and put some towels down because this wall is going to flood like it always does. And we went to bed with the towels down on, on the wall over there on the floor. Got up the next morning, and as we got out of bed, we both put our feet in water. The entire house had flooded except <laughs> for right around those towels. The towels and the wall were dry. And in that moment, God spoke to me and he said, you're constantly asking me to prove myself and you're asking for a fleece. Is this good enough for you? Is this a fleece good enough for you? And um, <laughs> it was just an amazing, amazing thing to see that God is right there. And he does even my childlike faith needing to have that confirmation. He cared enough to send that confirmation for us. I want to sing a song for you that is our family's heart, and this is why we even went to the mission field. It's called I'd Rather Have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold I'd rather be his than have riches untold I'd rather have Jesus than have 
roses or lands I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the I'd rather have you, Jesus, than anything this world affords, affords today. Rather have you, Jesus, than anything. Uh, um, um, amen. Um, that is our heart's cry. I don't care about anything this world has to offer me. I just want to see souls come to the Lord. And for God to use us in any way we can possibly be used. But um, I want to tell you a quick story of God's goodness and how he protects us and keeps us. So in our time there for the first year, when we first got there, we had to do all this setup. We had to find a house and we had to buy a car and furniture and all these things that you just have to have for life. And so we bought a car from some fellow missionaries, and that car <laughs> was the just, oh man, it gave us so many problems during our time that first year. And I told God, I said, God, I'll drive this car until the wheels fall off. Well, I got in the car one day with the family and we were leaving the school and the wheel fell off. <laughs> the whole axle had broken and the whole wheel just fell off. And there we went, kerplunk, down in the road. And, um, so then I said, well, God, I'll drive the car until the next wheel falls off or until this one I put back on will fall off. But one time in particular, we were struggling so, so badly with um, culture shock. And when you move to a different country, you just have this thing called culture shock where you feel like there are eyeballs on you at all times and you don't know what to do. And people will talk, speak to you and it sounds like they're speaking English, even though they're saying Spanish. And then when somebody's speaking uh, English, it sounds like Spanish. Spanish sounds like English. Did I just say the I repeated myself then. Um, but you get overwhelmed and you don't know what to do and you're just wanting to, to live life and survive, but yet you're overwhelmed with everything around you. And so one day we got in the car to go to, to, to work to the school and we picked up some Spanish teachers. They lived right there at our house and my, our car was dead on empty. 
And we were really just hoping we could get to the gas station, which is right at the end of the road, less than a quarter of a mile. And so we got about halfway there and the car just cuts off. So I thought, great, I've run out of gas here. I've done this to myself. So, but no, I hadn't. I got the car cranked back up. We got to the gas station, pulled up to the pump and the car cut off again, just cut off. And then all of a sudden, all of the lights, the headlights, everything in, inside and out starts flashing, just flashing, flashing, flashing. And then after that, black smoke just starts coming out of the emergency brake area and it's filling the car up and the kids are screaming the the spanish teachers are saying fuego fuego which is fire and they're they're freaking out and so they we all jump out of the car and poor bella was in the back of the car because we've had a record of 13 people in a little tiny car so people are sitting in laps and whatever so we're, we're trying to get out of the car and she's saying daddy get me out of this car help me so we got her out of the car and luckily the car didn't continue to burn it stopped however when it stopped and all the smoke cleared we tried to move the car and nothing would happen so we had to get it towed so the next day i get a call from a mechanic and the mechanic says wes i want you to know something he said i'm not exaggerating but he said this is a miracle of god that you're still here that your family's still here he said you had a, what he called an electrical storm in the car turns out that that someone had put in a battery the wrong way and that the cables the the metal was touching metal and it burned all the wiring in the car. But what it also did was it melted the fuel pump and it fused to the gas tank. And he said, I want you to know, he said, I'm not exaggerating. He said, I've never seen a car that has not blown up when this has happened. And he said, especially considering that it's better if you have a full tank of gas, you have a better chance if you have a full tank of gas versus an empty gas tank. He said, because the fumes will ignite easier and you'll blow up. He said, I don't know why and how you're here. And I immediately started crying because I'm just a big old <laughs> emotional guy anyway. Teddy bear is what everybody calls me. But anyway, I started bursting. I just burst out in tears and I said, I can tell you why. Because my God kept my family safe and he has a purpose and a plan for us. And so after that, I told Lindsay everything that happened and we were all overwhelmed and having that culture shock. And I looked at her and said, are you sure God's calling us to do this? I mean, I know Jesus had to give his life, but do I have to give ours? <laughs> so we decided <clears throat> that we were going to go for a walk. And you know it's serious if I go for a walk. I mean, that's serious. No, I'm kidding. But we, we went, decided to go for a family walk. And just down the road from our house, we were walking on the road. And um, Bella looked down and she said, Daddy, look at this rock. And she picked it up, and I'm not, I wish, I forgot to bring it, but it looks exactly like South Carolina. It looks like somebody had just sent it to a place with a laser and laser cut this rock. All the different angles, um, amazing, amazing, flat on both sides. And God spoke to me right in that moment and said, I want you to remember this moment. This is, I want this to be an Ebenezer stone for your family. Now, if you don't know, remember what Ebenezer Stone is, when the Israelites were going um, to the Promised Land, if they had a major event happen, they would set up stone monuments where they would pile stones up, and that, that would be their Ebenezer Stone, a, thing, a, a monument of remembrance of what God had done in their life. And God spoke to me and said, I want you to keep this rock as an Ebenezer Stone for your family of how I protected you. So being the redneck that I was, of course, brought it back, put it in a box, a shadow box, and attached some Christmas lights around it, like... <laughs> to accentuate it but we've got it at home and it serves as a, a memory of how God kept us and God was so good to us that he would even send a rock shaped like home like South Carolina it was God it was God saying to us I know where you've come from I know where you are and I've got you and you're gonna you're gonna be okay you're gonna make it I'm gonna ask Lindsay to come on up we're gonna um, sing a song for you it's old but it has such meaning in our lives now because of the things that God has allowed us at that time of growth um, down there. It's called through it all, but God is good through everything, and he has a purpose and a plan for everything in your life. Oh, and one more thing. Y'all need to pray for me on this one too because I've seriously done this before I was in church, and the, the song says, God gives me blessed consolation, and I sang, God gives me blessed constipation. In church. So I've got the words. I'm going to look at it and try not to do that tonight, all right? <laughs> Go ahead. 
I've had many tears and sorrows I've had questions for tomorrow There have been times I didn't know right from wrong But in every situation God gives me blessed consolation That my trials only come to make me strong I've been a lot of places And I've seen so many faces Yet there have been times I've felt so all alone But in that lonely hour, yes that blessed lonely hour Jesus let me know I am His own I wouldn't know what faith in His Word can do. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. show you a quick video well it's not too quick but it's <laughs> it's interesting so we'll keep your attention I want to show you a video of the property and what we do because for those of you who haven't been there sometimes it's hard to grasp what it looks like and and what the people are like but we have a video that the kids have created and it's um, set up like a newsroom and so our kids are going to take you and show you the property and some of the people on campus and what they do there we like we like for you to be able to hear that from our kids and we also like to be able to show you because there's something about actually being able to see the kids in their environment it just makes you want to go there right everybody want to come on down with us <laughs> that's what we hope we want everybody to experience what we get to on a daily basis another huge point that I like to make is we like for people to see that our kids are happy they're not crammed in some orphanage where life is depressing and it's horrible. Yes, they come from bad situations. And yes, we grieve that every day, the situations that they come from. However, we are rejoicing in the fact that we have a place for them to go and that is safe for them and is a Christ-centered environment that we get to offer them. Um, I just want to tell just a few stories really quick. There are days when I do get overwhelmed with how sad some of our kids' stories are. I'm going to tell you one of them. Um, but before I tell you that, on those days when I get so overwhelmed and sad about why are these kids here? Why did they get handed this kind of life? And I got to be raised in America where I didn't have to worry about these things. On days when I, when I feel that way, God always directs me to the story in John chapter 9 where the disciples and Jesus come upon the blind man and the disciples they just ask Jesus they're like why is this man blind is it because the sin of his parents or is it because his own sin why is he blind but Jesus just answered them and said 
Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And that is so beautiful. Doesn't matter. I mean, we all go through our tough circumstances, but when I look at our kids that are at the orphanage there, I do want to question why. Why, God? Why did they get put in a situation like this? But he always reminds me, just wait, Lindsay. (laughs) My work is going to be displayed in their life. And I'm so glad that we get to have a front row seat to that for our kids, watching the way that God works in their lives. Um, When we first took over in May of this year, we took a brief vacation home in June just for about a week and a half, and then as soon as we came back, we hit the ground running trying to figure out how we're going to run this home. And not two weeks into that, we received a phone call from um, the Child Protective Services, and they said, we have two girls that we would like to bring to you, and can, can they stay at your home? Well, we were shocked, first of all, because number one, we hadn't received any new children there to the home in over two years, and then Number two, we were just shocked at their ages because they told us we would never receive um, babies anymore. And these these two girls, one was nine months and one was 15 months. And to me, that's still, that's a baby. <laughs> um, so we were just shocked. And when they heard that two years ago, they went ahead and sold all of our baby stuff in a yard sale. So you have to think, we had nothing for these children <laughs> to come in, but we said, let's go ahead and bring them on. So they brought these two two little girls. One of them, the 15-month-old, she was severely malnourished and just, you know, the swollen stomach. Her hair was orange pretty much, and for a Honduran to have orange hair, there's something wrong. That That just showed signs of malnutrition. It was breaking off. Um, And then the other little girl, the nine-month-old, she had cigarette burns all over her body. And it was just something for Wes and I that we, I mean, we've worked with children in the States in and out of the foster care system. But for us, this was just, it was new. So, and it, it broke our hearts. But we have loved loving on those girls since they have been there. But that same day that they dropped them off to us, um, the social worker whispered in, um, my ear and she was like can you take a newborn baby too Um, he's in the hospital right now but can you take him in the next couple of days and I mean immediately I'm like yes I mean how do you say no to (laughs) to that when somebody when a newborn baby needs care and I said yeah and she said well he's in the hospital right now so and so I'm thinking I've got a few days (laughs) to get ready for a baby baby because you know these were babies but this is a newborn so we told her, yes, we'll take the child, and they called the very next day, and they said, we'll, we'll be there in 30 minutes with the baby. <laughs> I'm like, no, we're not ready. <laughs> we don't, I mean, I panicked. More than I panicked when I went under labor with my own three children, I was like running around campus looking at all the adults. I'm like, we're having a baby. We are having a baby, <laughs> and they're like, Lindsay, calm down, <laughs> um, but they did. They came and brought the baby, and he was so tiny, just four and a half pounds and just skin and bones. And I looked at him and I'm, I, I just I just immediately grabbed him and started loving on him. And um, we had the, the privilege of being able to name this child when he came. And um, they, they had given him just some random name just to fill out paperwork. And so we could sign, sign everything and know that he was going to be at the home. But my husband and I, we put a lot of effort into naming our kids, and I wanted him to have a name that had meaning behind it, not just some random name to sign paperwork. So we looked at different names, and of course, all the names that are coming to my head are like North American English names, <laughs> and I'm like, we can't scar this child for life. He's going to have to grow up in Honduras, probably, so I want to give him something that has a Spanish flair. Well, we found a Hebrew name that sounds kind of Spanish, and it's Abiel, A-B-I-E-L, and Abiel means God is my father, and we just rejoiced when we got to name him because we want him to know, you know, he will probably never know his birth father. Um, I hope very soon, very soon, I pray for all of our kids, they'll get to know the love of a family, so I hope someday he gets to know the love of an earthly father, but more importantly, I want him to always know wherever he goes that he has a heavenly father who loves him that story of abiel is not too far away from the story of all of the children at our home they all have a sad story but like i said 
I can't wait to see what God does with their lives. It is just an avenue for his work to be displayed, and we're so excited to see that. Um, case in point of that, I'm going to share one last story with you. I also, we, we, sorry, I say I a lot, and I mean we when I say I. Um, we had the privilege of one of our older, watching one of our older children come to the Lord this summer, and that was the highlight of my summer, I have to say, because Jolanda, for those of you who have been there, you can't w come on our campus and not know Jolanda. She makes herself known. So she's just a boisterous 17-year-old. She's going to turn 18 in March, and in 18 is when you technically have to leave the home. And it's always a fear of ours, like, are they ready for life? I mean, Honduras is a rough country to live in, and, and what we're able to provide for them at the home is is very close, honestly, to what we can provide for our kids here in America. So when you think about releasing them into Honduras, where there's gangs, there's violence, there's prostitution, it's scary. So, you know, we've been praying for Jolanda for as long as we've been there, and I know missionary after missionary that's like, God, when are you going to get a hold of Jolanda? <laughs> Please, Lord. Um, but this summer, she actually came to know Christ. And the most, the best thing about this story is that it wasn't a missionary that led her to Christ. It wasn't one of her teachers. It wasn't even one of the Tias or one of the workers there. It was two girls in her casita. It was her peers. And that excites us for no other reason other than, you know, we're trying to get them prepared for real life someday. But spiritually, that was a milestone for us because we feel like, yes, some of these kids are truly equipped to be able to go out into the world and make disciples, and that's exciting for us. That makes the, the hard days <laughs> worth it. So if you will, just remember to pray for Jolanda. We are actually considering that she be able to stay on for a whole nother year at the home just because she does, I mean, she's been in the home for 16 years, so she's got a lot of learning to do and, and preparations to make before she can face the world without any family and without anybody there to help her. So pray for her. Um, Wes and I are going to sing one more song for you tonight, and this song just mainly talks about how there's going to be no more night, and we are excited about the work we do and hopefully be making an impact and that all of our kids there at Good Shepherd will know Christ someday. Um, before we sing it really quick, though, I do want to mention that um, well, actually, I'll just mention that after we sing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Bow down and sing 
the only sound is the praises to Christ our King slowly the names from the book are read and I know the King so there's no need to dread no more night no more pain no more tears never crying again and praises to the great I am, we will live in the light of the risen Lamb. See over there, there's a mansion, oh, that's prepared just for me, where I will live with my Savior. Thank y'all so much for allowing us to be here um, tonight. I did want to mention really quick, um, as many of you walked in, you probably saw that there is a table back there, and I just want to explain some of the things that are on the table. Yes, we are responsible for raising support for our family to be on the mission field. So that is a huge um, that is a huge request. However, we don't want to focus so much on that as we want to tell you some of the other things that are on the table. But we do want everybody to stop and get a prayer card. Okay? These are free. Oh, I'd pay for these. <laughs> um, it is a picture of our family, but we want you to either put us on your fridge, put us in your Bible, whichever one you open the most. Okay? Pray for us. <laughs> All right. There are also some pictures of our kids. They're on little bookmarks. If you have ever considered sponsoring a child, um, whether it be your family, your small group, your Sunday school, um, or even just as an individual, we want you to take one of these cards. You don't have to commit tonight. It gives the information on the back if you're interested in it. Even if you're not interested and you just want to grab one of these and pray for these kids because it's an overwhelming responsibility for us to have gone from three kids to 88 in one night. So we want to pray for these kids like we would pray for our own. But sometimes we need a little help in that area. So if you want to take an individual child, put that face with that name and pray over them every day, that would be much appreciated. Um, and then we also have some jewelry back there. We have some new t-shirts for the home. Um, the jewelry that is back there, it looks like beads, but our children have actually made this out of paper, which is pretty cool. They rolled the paper and made those beads. They also have some woven ones with the string. Um, 
what we're trying to do is teach our kids responsibility and work ethic, like we said. We're trying to prepare them for when they have to face the world. So when you see these necklaces, you'll see a name attached to it. If you purchase one of them, just make sure we write down the name that's on it because the child who made it gets part of the proceeds. So it goes into their bank account um, for when they leave the home. But I purposely brought an orange and purple necklace up here because I am from the upstate. And there is only one team. <laughs> and then I think Barbara, it's Barbara, right? Barbara has already bought her some jewelry and she's sporting it. And it looks lovely with her shirt. So y'all make sure you stop by and check out the jewelry. Who, who is a Clemson fan in here? I just need to know. All right, this one's yours. Come on up. You can have this one. <laughs> I've been trying to sell this one, but nobody wants my Clemson colors. I'm just excited somebody wants it. <laughs> Um, but just stop by and see us at the table tonight on your way out. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having us here and just letting us share with you. This is a beautiful church and a beautiful part of the country, and we're just so excited to be able to come and see it and share this time with you. So I'm going to turn it back over to your pastor at this time. Um. Listen, they, they have blessed my heart, and uh, I know surely they've blessed your hearts, amen? Uh, and so we, we do want to uh, have an opportunity where we, we can give back to them. And so I'm going to ask if, if two of my men wouldn't come forward, and, and they're going to take uh, some plates, and they're going to be in the back for you there on the way out. If God just puts it in your heart to give to them, please give. Uh, I, uh, I know that uh, that's just the aspect of where you can help take care of them and their children. And they got some pretty kids. Did y'all see their kids? Amen. Listen, I got a nine and a six-year-old, so we need to pray for them. Amen. <laughs> they can be stressful being parents. But uh, I would like for all of us to stand up and, and for us to just have prayer. And then, um, if you would, I know that they'd probably like to get to their table. But uh, in, in some way, shape, or form, uh, just uh, come by and give them some encouragement of what they do. And, uh, and But w would you pray with us right now? Uh, Father in heaven, uh, thank you so much for their testimony of Jesus. And Father, thank you for their family. And Lord, you have moved in extraordinary measures in their lives, Lord. Not only to place them where they're at, but Father, to uh, make such impact in the lives of babies who will never know who held them through their darkest time. But God, you know. And Lord, you're going to raise those children up. And Father, I pray that each of those children grows up to be warriors of Jesus. And Father, I thank you so much for the seeds of salvation.